Okay. So what are we going to discuss today? We're going to just take a look at the pre-interview research, what we need to do, what research we need to undertake to ensure that we're equipped with sufficient knowledge about the organization, sufficient knowledge about the interviewers, sufficient knowledge about the team that we're joining, including our line manager potentially. So we're going to take a look at that pre-interview research. We're going to take a look at preparation that we need to um, undertake before we attend an interview, especially if we're talking about um, a, a video interview or a Zoom interview or Skype interview. What preparation do we need to undertake? If we're look, talking about a face-to-face -face, uh, interview, again, what preparation do we need to undertake before we actually go to the venue? The interview start time, I'll be asking us a trick question what time does our interview start? So that's a trick question. Remember that because I may not repeat that again, that that's a trick question. Then we'll be taking a look at the 30 second elevator pitch and our body language during interviews. How do we portray ourselves during our interviews? Depending on how we sit. Do we sit with our, you know, with our hands clasped together? Do we sit with well, one arm on the one arm on our head like this? We'll also be taking a look at answering interview questions, how we answer questions and how we ask questions, the sort of questions that we should be asking within our interviews. And then post-interview follow-up. What is good practice? So I don't actually talk about best practice because no one is. Uh, no one's claiming to be a um, seer or, or, you know, I mean, or a king or queen of interviews. But what is good practice? What are the recommendations that we should try and follow once we've finished our interview, the minute we step out of our interview room? So that is the outline for today. Now, pre interview research. What do we tend to do? Most often we tend to just look at the company website to um, find out um, you know, information about the company, the name of the company, but we need to actually go beyond just obtaining the full name of the company. One of the things that I recommend is that we take a look at the core company personnel. So who's the CEO of the company? because that won't be stated in your invitation to your interview. But if you can find out the name of the CEO of the interview, for example, once you're in your interview, you can actually mention news that you've read about the CEO, especially positive news. So you don't really wanna go and say, or, you know, I mean, I, I read that your um, CEO was recently admitted for um, coronavirus. Did he used to wear a mask? <laughs> or how did he catch it? No, but if we find out, okay, that the CEO of the company, for example, is an influencer on LinkedIn, we can raise that during our interview. If we find out that the CEO was recently quoted in the press or interviewed on Sky or on the news, we can also mention that during our interview because that, may, that lets the company understand that you have followed the company, you've viewed the website, you've understood what you've read on the website because it is a basic expectation for all interviewers that you actually view their website anyway before you go, in, go for your interview. However, most interviewers are asking for far more than us simply viewing their website. They're asking for you to actually understand what you've read about their web or on their website and to ask questions based on what you've read there. So we need to find out who the core company personnel are. Um, Timmy's just raised their hands there. Yes, someone, uh, Joy in the group, is asking for the volume to be increased. I think she said it's a bit low. 
So maybe you okay. can share to your... Oh, oh, all right, what I'll do is let me just um, alt tab out of this and see whether I can increase that. Apologies, and there goes our door. If you heard the doorbell, then... Um, so, sorry, let me just... Um, let me just go to the audio settings and increase the... Volume. Am I a bit louder there? Well, I can hear you quite well. Maybe it's at end, but at least if you can try, do it. Okay, so I've increased the volume as much as I can. So can any can everybody hear me, please? Joy, can you hear now? Everybody's yes, 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 yes. So, so okay. All right. Hear. So if everyone can hear me, then I'll just continue. No. Mm. Okay, so we view the core company staff. We make sure that we understand the key company personnel, who is within the company and what influence they're having in society. And we cite that during our interviews. We also, during our pre-interview research, take a look at any key projects that the company is undertaking. Let's say you've read that the company is part, partnering up with, uh, with an organization, with a charitable organization, for example. So there's something that we refer to as corporate social responsibility, where a company undertakes a charitable event for the year or for three years. They may say that they're partnering with cancer research for the next three years, and that they'll be donating a certain amount of funds to cancer research. So during your pre-interview research, you take note of this, again, so that you mention it during your interview and you ask questions around this. You can say, I'm actually interested in can cancer research, for example, and I'm interested in what you're doing about cancer research. I'm interested in that initiative. Do you allow your employees, for example, to volunteer during the year for your corporate social responsibility projects? So we identify any key projects. We also take a look at the company's financial statements. And I think that's very important, not only for your interview, not only for during your interview, for you to ask questions, but for you to also decide whether you want to join that company. Let's say you're in a stable job currently, and you now um, go and view this company's financial statements because they've invited you for an interview, and you find that their, their finances have been in the red for the past five years. You need to ask yourself the question, would I really like to join this organization? May I be made redundant a year on? A year after I joined or within six months after I joined the company. So view their financial statements and as I said in my last um, ACO interview course, I'll be doing a um, delivering over the next month or two, a board director's um, course or board trustee, school governor, or um, a charitable trustee um, course workshop. And within there, you know, I mean, we'll spend some time just discussing how to view and how to understand what's being stated in those financial statements because it's very important. If the company has invested in a major project for 10 years, again, you could ask questions around that project during your interview. I'm not one to buy into those um, you know, Google sites where they say, here are the questions to ask at your interview, here are the questions that you might be asked and here's how to answer them. And that's why this workshop isn't going to tell you the specific questions to ask. 
Because if we tell you the specific questions to ask, or if you go on to Google and find out the top 100 questions to ask at your interview, you'll find that a million or one other people would have read those same reports and you'll be asking the same questions as them. But if you conduct thorough research into a company, you'll find that you'll be asking different questions to everyone else that, that attends those, uh, you know, the same interview with you. And you'll be asking questions that actually impress your interviewers. In some cases, you may find that the interviewers don't know the answers to the questions themselves. Because if you're interviewing with an IT director, for example, that IT director may not have read their financial statements. And they'd be quite impressed that you've come in there and you're asking them questions about their financial statements, about their key projects. Again, we need to actually also read Google News reports. What is being said about the company? What is the company's reputation like? Are you joining an ethical company? Or are you joining a company that's recently been in the news for money laundering? Or where the company has been taken to a tribunal Due to bullying, again, you ask yourself the question, do you want to actually attend an interview with such a company? But again, if it's positive news, you raise the news that you've read during your interview. You raise all that news and try and impress them. Social media, again, go on view what is being said about the company on LinkedIn, on, um, on um, Facebook. If employees have started a campaign against the company, again, would you like to join or would you like to give that company a miss? Glassdoor, so Glassdoor, do many of do most of us know what glass story is about well i think those who attended the first um, workshop will know what it's about um timmy would you like to tell us what it's about um, it's a site that you can go to find that it's more like where you get reviews about companies about people uh, roles um the salary the typical salaries for the role that you are trying to apply for or you are going for basically this the google for you to prepare yourself if you are going for interviews it's a good website yeah it's a good site it's a review yeah. site uh, absolutely so it is a good website and we need absolutely every you know source of information that we can find to um you know get you know to ace our interviews so go on Glassdoor, go and identify the culture of the company, go and identify what the rating of the CEO is from employees. Go and see, again, questions that you can ask there. If someone's talking about the CEO as a positive person that walks about, that goes around the company, meeting and shaking hands with everyone not during covid of course but that goes round to everyone's best side to meet them and find out how they're doing again raise that during your interview on linkedin what do you do you also follow companies that you would like to work at follow them and whenever they make an announcement, whenever the CEO comments or whenever an employee or, or a leader comments or their PR person comments on LinkedIn, 
please make absolutely sure that you follow and you like their posts. That way they notice you. They notice you more actually if you comment constructively on their posts. But liking is also good. Like the company, comment on the company's social media announcements. If you've got something constructive to say, that way you get noticed before you've even applied for a job there. So you don't have to think about companies that you want to work with today. If you know that you'd like to work with JP Morgan in five years time, start following them from today. Start commenting on their posts from today because that brings you to their notice. That brings you to their attention. And when they're now reviewing your LinkedIn profile, for example, they go and take note of what's been said, what you have said about the company, how you've responded to their posts. So let's actually be forward looking, forward thinking, make sure that we're doing all of this proactively to increase our chances of success during our interviews and at our interviews. So, pre-interview preparation. 30 second elevator pitch. Now, what is our 30 second elevator pitch? That is something that is so brief about ourselves where we're saying something really potent that the interviewer will remember about us. So we need to actually practice our 30 second elevator pitch. And something that I didn't say in the last session we had was that your 30 second elevator pitch can actually change for each interview. Why? Because if you're not going for an interview for the same role, let's say you're going for a business analyst interview, in one instance, then you're attending a project manager interview in another in instance, your 30 second elevator pitch would be different or might be different. But the most important thing is that when we're preparing for our interview, we need to practice and practice and practice our 30 second elevator pitch. Can someone tell me something about themselves? Uh, can, uh, we've got a business analyst on this, uh, um, on, the, on the course here. Can you please, can a business analyst please give me a 30 second elevator pitch about themselves? Okay, Timmy, could you kindly um, try that? A 30 second elevator pitch about yourself? Have we got anyone else who's able to give us a 30 second elevator pitch? Everyone's too shy. Okay, well, since you spoke, Janine, could you kindly give us a 30 second elevator pitch about yourself? I don't know if I can last for 30 uh, seconds, but I'll try. Um, so my name's Janine Chinnery. I work for Heimdall Security, which is the fastest Danish cybersecurity company in Europe at the moment. Um, we work with RBS Group and law enforcement agencies such as the FBI, uh, Europol, Youth Department of Justice, and I'm committed to helping companies uh, with their cybersecurity, helping them to find cost effective and robust solutions to protect their organization, themselves, and their users and clients. 
thank you so much. And you do know that that went over 30 seconds, by the way. Wowee. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, uh, exactly. So 30 seconds is not a long time at all. But another thing that I'd say is that for your 30 second elevator pitch, it needs to be about you as an individual. Yes. I was not prepared, so I just had to say something I, 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 for 30 I know. seconds. <laughs> I, 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 I know, I, I know. I, I know we put you on the spot there. Anyone else like to say something about themselves as a business analyst or a project manager? Uh, say something for 30 seconds about yourself. Yeah. <clears throat> Hello, Ibuko. Good morning. Good morning. Um, can, can I try? Yes, of course you can try. <laughs> you spent 30 seconds asking if you can try. Yeah, let me try. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I'm Ola Holo. Um, I'm a proactive and result oriented yes. uh, delivery manager, Scrooge Master. I've worked in office of the SDLC, uh, working with uh, constructional teams. Um, I deliver IT solutions. Um, I've helped business to translate from manual process to digital processes. Um, I've been involved in virtually all aspects of uh, software development. Um, um, I, I developed over time in my career, I've developed solid relationships with big technical stakeholders um, to make sure that project is being delivered according to plan, putting into consideration time, scope, budget. Thank you so much. Th thank you so, so much. I, I, I think you've got a, you, you've got a five hour elevator. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. So you've done well. Yes. I mean, so you've talked about yourself, which is fantastic. Yeah. So 30 second elevator pitch has to be about ourselves, about me. This is what I am. This is what I do. This is what I do. First Can I try? On the dot. So Can I try? Yes, please. Yes, De definitely try. After you, I'll try. Okay, I'll go on. Yeah, yeah, definitely go. Go on. Hello, good morning. My name is Bemi Oyekon. I'm a professional digital marketer specializing in e-commerce. And I have a specialization to help personal brands, experts, coaches, and mentors monetize their talent using digital marketing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, who said they wanted to go next? I, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I want to go next. Yeah, my name is Esera Tawo. I am presently a postgraduate student of oil and gas engineering at Robert Gordon University. My passion for life is to make sure that we have sustainable energy supplied to us to carry on our daily activities as humans and to take care of the earth as well. And I'm a real person. I love sports. I love soccer. I love basketball. I love Lewis Hamilton, Formula One racing. And I love life in general. That's my little bit of it. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. Fantastic. I'm sorry to say that I didn't say fantastic to everyone else's, but I just love that what Essia said there because you didn't only talk about what you do, but you also talk about what you enjoy doing, not only in your work, but also in your personal life. So that is the perfect pitch in 30 seconds of what you do and what you are. What you do and what you are. So it's important that during your elevator pitch, you state what you do and what you are within 30 seconds. And we'll talk about that when we get to another question, or when we get to the question, what I want to spin there. So again, you practice your 30 second elevator pitch until you're not saying, um, and you're not thinking about it. So if that means that you have to get in front of your mirror, to practice, so be it. You get in front of your mirror or you practice it in front of somebody that, you, that you're confident with or comfortable with, you make sure you practice that until you're able to speak without interruption, without fear, without blushing, without pausing, like an elevator pitch. You also practice your questions for the interviewers. Now, when they ask you at the end of the interview, do you have any questions? Please never say, I don't have any questions. Please don't say that. 
always have questions. So you can have some questions from your pre-interview research, which is why it's important to conduct that research. So you have some questions from there where you're asking, okay, I read this on your website. I read this on LinkedIn. The CEO posted this on LinkedIn. So you've got those questions to hand. And then you may also have questions that you ask from what you've heard during the interview, which you can't practice because you can't practice anything until you've actually heard what they've got to say during your interview. However, what you can practice is questions around your pre-interview research. So take at least three questions, three constructive questions that you can ask your interviewers. Pre-interview preparation, know your CV off head. Know your CV. Know what you've written in your CV. If you've written out any jobs or any tasks that you've performed in previous roles from your CV, you need to remember not to say that you did that. So for example, let's say you were in an admin role three years ago. That's fine, it's on your CV. But if you didn't like filing, don't include that on your CV as a task that you performed because you know that you never want to do that again. So your CV should consist of what you've done previously, what you know that you can do if asked to perform that task during your interview. And if you've done things previously, that you don't like doing, don't put it on your CV. It doesn't need to be on your CV. So know what you've written down on your CV inside out. Then you also make sure that you follow key influencers on LinkedIn and Twitter, as I said, and you like and comment on their posts. So key company influencers on LinkedIn and Twitter, and then you like and comment on their posts. That is so important. So important. We like and we comment on posts on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is not just a CV board or a CV site. It is not just that. LinkedIn, Twitter. There's sites where you can go on to and not only follow influencers, but also influence, be an influencer. Each and every one of you that has attended, signed up to this workshop today, have something inside you that you can share with the world. That is a fact. Each and every one of you has something that you can teach me today. That is fact number two. But fact number three is that not everyone understands the fact that they are an influencer in their own right. Each and every one of you are an influencer in your own right. So you follow key company influencers on LinkedIn and you comment so that you can be viewed as an influencer yourself, as the influencer that you actually are. Again, please delete all inflammatory posts on social media. Sometimes people comment and then we respond rudely on social media. We should make sure that we do not comment, you know, in, in any rude manner, if we're inflamed by anything that is written on social media, the best thing to do is to not comment at all. Turn off your laptop and go and drink a Diet Coke or have a Kit Kat. But don't comment if you don't 
have to comment or if you haven't got anything constructive to say. And if you have commented in the past, then make sure you delete all your, all your inflammatory posts on social media. Because what tends to happen is that before a company invites you to an interview, they will go and view your social media activity. They always do that. Sometimes I've had recruiters contact me on the phone and when they ring me on the phone, as I'm talking to them, I actually go on to LinkedIn and you would see that the last person to view your profile was that interviewer. So they do go and check on your social media profiles, including Facebook, if you haven't locked that down, to try and identify the kind of person that you are. So make sure you delete all inflammatory posts on social media so that it doesn't turn recruiters off you. Now, if you're going to an interview in person, a face-to-face -face interview, it's important that you turn off your phone before you get into the interview venue. Because it's so easy to forget to turn off your phone and then it goes off during your interview. It's so easy to have your interview to have your phone go off in reception and then you pick it up and say to someone, ah, am I been more an interview? <laughs> I've heard that before. Sorry for speaking another language, but that is my language. So that in Yoruba is saying, so sorry, I can't talk. I'm in an interview. in reception. So as you're getting into the interview venue, you make sure that you turn off your phone. A lot of us tend to use our phone as a navigator to get to the interview, you use the maps, which is fine, but make sure that as you walk into the venue, you turn off the phone. And then you remove noisy or dangly jewelry or watches as well. So you remove noisy or dangling jewelry or watches. Make sure that there's nothing making noise during your interview. If you're actually attending your interview from home, if it's a remote interview, you make sure that you test your Wi-Fi. And if your Wi-Fi isn't working, then you need to go to somewhere else where the Wi-Fi is it, where the Wi-Fi is um, going to work. If you're going for a remote interview, you make sure that you dress up. And you dress up as if you're attending an interview in real life. I had something happen to me um, two weeks ago, actually, a fortnight ago. So we had a workshop online and I had my headscarf round my head because nobody actually said that the interview that, that that the workshop would be that the workshop would be you know that they would automatically admit you with a video so as soon as i signed into the workshop i just found that um people de delegates were uh, you know i mean that delegates were staring at me with my scarf on with my headscarf on. And I really wasn't impressed, but then I just realized that actually that it was my fault because I didn't dress up as if I was going to the office. So ensure that you dress up for a remote interview as if you were attending that interview in person. And if you need to use the restroom or you need to go anywhere, then make sure you switch off your webcam. 
and mute your mic because I'm sure that many of us will have seen these videos being distributed over um, some Skype participants that have taken their um, phone or whatever it is into the restroom and um, unfortunately not switched it off before using the restroom. So we switch everything off and we excuse ourselves politely, but better still, if you're attending a remote interview, do all of that business before you start your interview. If you're attending the interview in person, make sure you plan your journey and you arrive 15 minutes before your interview. If you arrive half an hour before your interview, what are the, what, what are the issues? What, why would an employer have an issue with you arriving half an hour, let's say, before your interview? Anyone want to respond to that question? Why not half an hour? Why not an hour before your interview to show that you're conscientious? Why not arrive an hour before? You're going to be putting them on a spot. They will be uncomfortable too. What if they have other candidates that they are interviewing before you? So half an hour is just okay because you don't want to. It's more like you. Over. It's not. It's good to be prepared. One hour is just stretching it. Yes, an hour is stretching it, absolutely. And indeed, some companies will say 30 minutes is also stretching it. The reason... Yeah, that... sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, yes, go sorry on. Sorry to interrupt you, please. My question is, is 15 minutes also too bad? 15 minutes before? Um, 15 minutes isn't too bad. But let, let me just conclude on the 30 minutes. Because 30 minutes, okay. if they're running late with their previous interview... Then, then you would find, you, you would actually meet the person coming out, the person that preceded you coming out as you're waiting in reception. And employers don't necessarily like that. So many tend to fit a half hour gap in between each interview to give the previous person time to depart and for them to also have time to prepare for the next candidate. So if you arrive 15 minutes before your interview, what you're finding, what you will find is that the previous person would have departed, they will be in the interview room discussing the next, uh, discussing the previous um, candidate, and as soon as you arrive, as soon as it's time for you to attend your interview, they will be ready to call you in. So 15 minutes is the ideal time, but please let's note that whilst I say 15 minutes is the ideal time to arrive before your interview, I always like to be within two minutes of walking into the building at least half an hour before the interview. So when I say arrive 15 minutes before your interview, what I'm saying is walk into the building and be in reception. But that doesn't mean that you can't be down the road or two doors away just waiting for 15 minutes before your interview. You'd, I'm, I'm not saying that you leave it to 15 minutes before you arrive at the local station, but I mean as in you walk into the door, but be in the area within walking distance half an hour before your interview, just in case there are delays on the train. So your question, Essie, was quite valid there. Yes, make sure you're in the area 30 minutes before your interview, or even an hour Thank before you. your interview, if you want to. However, walk in the door 15 minutes before your interview is set to start. Which leads me on to my next question. When does your interview really start? Does anyone want to tell me the answer to that question? Anyone want to have a go? The so, moment you enter the room. The moment you enter which room? Uh, the interview room. 
Okay. The oh, yeah, maybe probably the, the, reception the reception as well. Reception. <laughs> it starts from reception. It starts from reception. It the company. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The minute you walk through that door, and I'd even say something else, actually. If the company has CCTV that leads into the building, your actions outside the building could also be adjudged as part of your interview. So let's say you're chewing gum, walking down the street as you're approaching the building, and then you take out that gum, spit it into a tissue, and that is captured on CCTV. Again, that is part of your interview. But officially, the minute you walk into that reception, the way you greet the receptionist, the way you greet the security guard is all part of your interview. So your interview doesn't start from the minute you walk into the room. It doesn't start from 10 o'clock if they said your interview is starting from 10 o'clock. It starts from the minute you walk into that building. And the security guard and receptionist will have a say or could have a say in your recruitment process. Let's say you've been really polite to the receptionist, and that same receptionist has to take you into the interview room. At the end of the day, the receptionist will remember and will say to the interviewers, oh, that person was really nice. This is what they said to me. So when we're going into that reception, when we're seeing the security guard, we can actually say, how was your weekend? How are you? How are you? When the receptionist is taking you up in the lift, if they're asking, did you have a good weekend? Or what did you do over the weekend? What should you be saying to them? Can someone tell me what we should be saying to them? We should be saying that we were preparing and looking forward to being at the interview. Exactly. And that's where our 30 second elevator pitch again comes in, because we should be saying, oh, I was preparing towards this, towards this interview because I'm really, you know, excited to want to join this company. I've heard X, Y, Z about the company. So your interview starts from the minute you enter the building and at every opportunity, you start laying out what you're about. Oh, I was really preparing for this um, interview because I'm really excited about the prospects of joining. It's right up my street. This is what I do. This is what I've done. How about you? So we engage with the security guard, we engage with the receptionist, we engage with absolutely everybody that we encounter. If you see someone cleaning the reception area, engage with them. You go to the restroom, you go to the ladies or to the gents, you see the cleaner there, engage with them. Engage with them. We don't turn our nose down at anybody in that company. Engage with them. Can I say something, please? Yeah, yes, please, go ahead. 
Um, just um, based on what you said in terms of engaging with people, I remember I went for an interview. This was actually, um, I took a taxi and a taxi driver was asking me, oh, what am I doing and where am I going? And I just engaged with him and everything. Fortunately, during the interview, they asked me how was the trip and everything. And I mentioned uh, with the taxi driver and everything and I got the job. <laughs> so I'm sure maybe it's one of those things that I did um, mention and stuff. Maybe that's one of the reasons why they give the job as at that time. Yeah, yes, it's so important to show that, to demonstrate that we are humans and that we recognize that everybody working in that company is also a human being. Is also a human being with equal rights to dignity and respect. So we smile, we smile, we say hello to everybody. Everybody that we encounter on our way to our interview and when we're departing from the building. So that's what we do with our pre-interview prep. And I've asked this question already. So when does our interview start and end? When we're approaching the office, when we get into our reception hall, the elevator or the interview room? And it's when we're approaching the office. Let's be mindful. We shouldn't be dropping pieces of paper anywhere anyway. But if you've got, if you've printed out a map to, the, to, to your um, interview venue, don't just throw that on the street as you, go, as you approach the office. If you can't find a bin, put it in your bag. Put it in your bag. because you don't know whether there are cameras that are picking you up as you're approaching the office. Questions, comments? Questions, comments? Um, hi. Hello, go first ahead. Of all, first of all, I just want to thank you for a very insightful um, presentation. Actually, I was cycling and I've been listening to you. And um, when I did my 30 second speech, I was actually on, on my bicycle. <laughs> so it's been very engaging for me whilst working out, listening to this. I've now started taking some notes. What would you say are your top three key um, nuggets for, for this, for your interview tips for today? Top three, please, or top five. Let me know make it too difficult for you. Be Thank yourself. You be prepared be amiable be confident and give it all you've got so be yourself be prepared be amiable be confident and give it all you've got present yourself as the best person for the role that they could ever find Thank you very much. That was six, but um, yes. <laughs> but you put me on the spot. <laughs> Did anyone else want to um, say, give a 30 second elevator pitch now, please? So, so, sorry, please, please, you said, sorry, you said be yourself, be prepared, be amiable, be confident, give it all you've got. What's the last yeah. one? And um, uh, have, have you said be confident? Yes. Um, you said else I've written. I've, I've sell seen sell it, yourself I, as if you are the best person for the job. Yeah, yeah, oh, okay, exactly. all right. Yeah, thank you yourself. very much. Thank you so much. There. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. So, sorry, someone's raised their hands again. So please um, speak. Please speak. Um, uh, yeah. Hello. Um, <laughs> yes, I I haven't got um, an elevator speech, but I. 
basically just want to thank you and then the lady who invited me to this uh, she sent me the link yesterday and um, i can tell you i'm actually listening to you from the gym and um, it's been fun really i've had um, a couple of interviews uh, some that didn't go well and some that um, uh, went well but this um, this is really um, a game changer for me so i uh, I can't thank you enough for the, um, for the presentation. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, okay, Th thanks so much. And, and, and we haven't finished, so please, uh, um, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I know that we're all um, yeah, grateful, and, and I'm also grateful for the opportunity and the privilege to share with you as well, because, mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, I, I'm Ibuko, that's just my name, and, and I thank God to, that my parents actually gave me that name. So um, all I'm doing is trying to live up to that name. And I'd also like to say thank you so much to Timmy, who's um, been such a blessing, who's really helped to promote these courses, and who's really encouraged me to keep on doing. Yeah. Keep on doing. So thank you, since we're all saying thank you to everyone, saying thank you to ourselves, and thank you to all of you mm -hmm. That have actually registered to attend and have come on. So thank you so much to you all. Now, would someone else like to give us a 30 second elevator pitch about themselves? 30 seconds? I'll try. Excuse me, before we proceed, um, thank you all for saying thank yous and thank you for being here. We have now reached the maximum that we can admit for this course. 100 people so if you have sent your um, the invitation to other people and they are struggling to attend please encourage them to attend our next session so unfortunately we won't be able to att um, admit more people uh, secondly if you are on LinkedIn can you please do us a favor we the only thing we ask back from this session is the free session so much for my eyes thank you it's a free session and the only thing we ask back is that you please follow the ladder back down on LinkedIn and then share the good news with your friends. So if you, um, sis, can you let me share my screen so that I can show them? Yes, please, thank you. We have 75 people and we have 100, well, it's now 99 people online. So if we can have the same number of people, if you have not followed the ladder back down before, if we can have the same people online to go and follow that, um, that profile or that page on LinkedIn and just leave us a comment because we need this information to know that the feedback we are getting back from you, you are not only enjoying it, you are gaining from it, but it's also helping us to build a profile for the organization. So please do so if you are still online and you're on LinkedIn. Thank you. Do I need to do anything at this end? Um, if you can share ladder back down or from LinkedIn, because okay. I, I can share the okay. What I can do is we can just search for ladder back down on LinkedIn, yeah, and we'll find a few ladder back downs. We don't want you to get the wrong one, so I'm going okay. to so I'm maybe you could see in, in the comment okay. section, please. I've just done that. Thank okay. you, yeah, in the comment section. Thank you so much. So please, could we have someone share um, for 30 seconds about themselves? And we've had individuals raise their hands, two participants have raised their hands. I, I hope that they're willing to share. Um, please um, share 30 seconds about yourself. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Should I? Yes, please, go ahead. Right. Um... My name is Ole Awe. I've been working as a business analyst now for almost eight years. Uh, prior to that, I used to work as a software test analyst where I got exposed uh, to various software application um, development lifecycle um, from requirement gathering to maintenance and also experience uh, in test lifecycle. I've worked with various industry, retail and insurance and uh, plus finance, uh, finance industry. And um, experience wise, um, I've experienced the BA life cycle from discovery um, to discovery to understanding the big, the big, the big pictures and um, uh, determining the performance metric and gathering high level um, to planning and design and build. Um, also involved in implementation and warranty. Um, I'm still looking uh, to develop myself in this area and taking my career forward. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much. That was over 30 seconds, and I'm not sure if I gathered 
uh, that much about you as an individual but if we allow someone else to but thank you so much for that i gained a lot about your experience and your career but not that much about you as an individual what you like doing so we'll give someone else an opportunity to um to also comment on what they um, are about including their career to date can i try yes definitely 30 seconds go ahead right. yeah my name is Tulu Adesanya. Um, I'll describe myself as a hybrid planner and business analyst with over eight years experience in process engineering, requirement engineering, process improvement, change management, stakeholder management, and digital transformation. Also, I'm a certified practitioner. I have the ability to plan, manage, and monitor future duties. Um, oh, excuse me. Excuse me. <laughs> That's all right. Sorry about that. That's okay. It's all right. I've exceeded my 30 seconds. Okay. No, no, but I'd still like to hear about you because I believe your um, child may have um, yeah, take, yeah. taken part of your 30 seconds. So happy for you to start again and to tell us about you, what you like. I mean, what and what influence you've had in your career. So it's great to say, yes, I'm a this. I, I do this, I do stakeholder management, but is there something that you've done during your career that you could say, okay, stakeholder management, I did this, I achieved this. So, so you start with your 30 seconds again. Oh, okay. Again, I'll say, um, I'll describe myself as an hybrid planner slash uh, business analyst with over eight years of experience in uh, process engineering requirement engineering, process improvement, change management, stakeholder management, and um, digital transformation. Um, my experience in stakeholder management involves working with various work stream lead, i.e. finance, okay. su yeah, supply chain management, HR, IT okay. project managers. Also, as a Okay, you've done your one minute now. <laughs> Yes, it's just enough. Day. <laughs> oh, okay. Anyone Thank else like to me. share a thirty-second elevator pitch that tells us not only about themselves, but also about not not only about an impact that they've had in their career, but also about you know what they enjoy. And I may ask Essie to share his elevator pitch again once we've had another volunteer. Can I try? Yes, <laughs> happy for you to try, definitely. Um, my name is Mary. I'm a professional, um, an accomplished project management. Prof um, sorry, I'm going to start again. <laughs> okay, go on. Yes, um, my name is Mary. I'm a project manager. I help a um, project team in making sure that they deliver to time and to budget. And I also am responsible for developing business case and supporting business and benefit realization. I enjoy interacting with different people. I enjoy cooking at my leisure time. And I also love watching Netflix series. Thank you. Fantastic. And then they may ask you, what, 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 what series have you watched within Netflix? So we make sure that if we're saying we enjoy watching Netflix, we're able to share um, yeah, something about that if they ask us anything in the future. But that is good. That is really, really good. Um, anyone Wait, else want to share? Are you else? able to take one more? Yes, definitely. Please go ahead. <coughs> um, hi, my name is Afola Kemi. I am a data-focused business analyst with extensive experience within the financial services. I have delivered on regulatory projects adopting both waterfall and agile methodology when i am not delivering projects particularly in recent times i'm offering my time to charity activities and that i hope to do more of fantastic that, that is an excellent elevator pitch as well 
so well done. So, so we've had a good one to, you know, I mean, all of them have been good, but we just need to practice and practice. But the first one from Essie and I feel like Emmy's ones, they stood out because you not only briefly told us about your experience in your career, but you also talked about what you do in your private life. I mean, so I'll go next. I mean, I'll just share briefly. So I'm a book queen, Manuel Adebayo. I'm a mom of five. I'm really passionate about business integrity. Although I work as an IT and infosec leader, I'm passionate about business integrity, but compassionate about the humans that I lead on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's all there is to me, basically, in 30 seconds. And I mentioned um, business integrity twice, but my 30-second elevator pitch is simply what I'm passionate about, what I'm compassionate about, that is human beings, and what I've done over the past 20 years of my career. So our 30 seconds elevator pitch must be timely. It must be relevant to the role. It must be relevant to the role. So if I'm going in, for example, as a junior person within a team, then I wouldn't be saying that I spent 20 years leading, for example. So I've changed that to, I've worked in the IT and infosec industry for 20 years. So it has to be relevant to the role, has to be brief, has to be convincing as well. You need to be telling the truth about yourself. So, I said, for example, there that if asked what Netflix series you watch, you need to actually be able to expand on that. We don't have Netflix. I've never watched Netflix in my life, for example. So if I were to go in and say yes, because I've heard people talk about a series, for example, I remember Game of Thrones. Everyone was raving about Game of Thrones back then, but I didn't watch a single series. I've never watched a single episode of Big Brother for any country. So if I were to go and start talking about Big Brother or um, Game of Thrones now, because I've heard a lot of friends talk about it, then I wouldn't be convincing. And if asked a follow-up question, I wouldn't then be able to respond. So our 30 seconds also needs to be uh, stated or spent confidently articulating what we're about. 30 seconds, I am a leader in the industry. This is what I've done. These are my passions, both at work and externally. I'm a mom of five, so that is clearly a passion of mine. My children are clearly a passion of mine. I'm an IT and infosec leader. That is what I do. I'm passionate about business integrity. And I'm compassionate about the people that I lead as well. That is my brief elevator pitch. But that would change and could change, as I've just said then. We make sure that it's relevant to the environment in which we're going to work with them. So, body language, our body language, our handshake should be cordial. So, not too hard. We don't want to break the fingers of the recruiters, because that would be a very bad start. But it should not be too limp as well. And thankfully, as we now know, handshakes are off for now. So we give a nod and we could joke briefly about the fact that we can't shake hands during this pandemic. And when we're in our interview chair, whether this is online or face to face, we need to sit upright because you're not down and you're not out. Despite there being this lockdown, Despite you possibly being out of work currently, you're not down or out. 
So you need to sit confidently as if you actually recognize your worth because you should recognize your worth. Sit upright, be confident in your body language. And if you know that your hands are shaking or that your hands tend to shake, then decline any offer of coffee. Decline any offer of coffee because you don't want to spill your coffee all over yourself, all over your, or, or your notepad. And make eye contact, especially if you have a panel of interviewers. If you've got a panel of interviewers, you make eye contact with each person. Don't try and outstare anybody. Because unfortunately, when you've got a panel interview, actually, the interviewers, they only have to make eye contact with one person, which is you. They're, all of their focus is, is on you. But you now need to equally distribute your focus across all of the panel members. If there's three, which is the usual number of, you know, usual maximum number, hopefully there's not five, in which case it turns into an interrogation. But if there's three, and I have attended one of those actually in my lifetime many years ago, where there were five um, people on the panel, but most of the times it's usually two or three. And you need to make sure that you spread your gaze evenly at each of those interviewers. You make eye contact. If you've got shaky or sweaty hands, again, you clasp your hands together. You keep your hands together. You keep your hands together unless you've asked the question, can I please take my CV out? Or can I please take notes. What do we think about notes for interviews? Do, do, do any of us take a notebook in or, or do we just not take a notebook in and just sit there with our hands? Why, should, why might we need to take a note in? But I like taking notes because sometimes they are saying some things that might help me in my questioning towards the end of the interview or whenever they, I want to clarify something. And then it shows them that you are interested, you are engaging with them, you are passionate about taking the role and there might just be some important points that you are taking down and they would appreciate that. It's more like, you're, it's more like you are really interested in the plan, the process. Uh, absolutely, so you're quite right then. So you ask the question first, Please, may I take notes? Please okay, I have, I sorry, I have notes. a question. Yeah, yes, go ahead with your question. Um, is there a limit to the size of the notebook you can take with you? Should you carry something very conspicuous or a, a little notepad is okay? Yeah, I know it's a funny question, but yeah. <laughs> Well, well, well I, would, I, I would take a notepad because you're not exactly going in there to write absolutely everything that's being said because the danger of writing... Can, can, I, show you, can I show you the kind of notepad I'm talking about here? Because I have um, a very small one with me, if you don't mind. Just in, uh, well, um, what, what, well, you can take any size you want to. Oh, okay. Y you know, you can take any size you want to, but all you're taking notes for is... You're, you're, you're taking bullet points. You're just taking bullet points so that you can ask questions later, as Timmy's just said. So if you take large notebooks, the issue is that, you know, wh where are you going to put that in? Are you going to take that in a briefcase or, or a suitcase or a, you know, massive bag? So, so just take a notebook and ask the question because they may actually mind you taking notes and sometimes taking notes may actually cause us to forget to maintain that eye contact the essence of a notebook is just to take brief bullet points 
whilst we maintain eye contact to allow us to ask questions later on. Can I ask a question, please? Yes, please. So I've had an interview in the past where I've been told you're being recorded. Is that okay with you? So I said, yes. Okay. And I've then gone into another interview and I have had to secretly record it, the whole interview session just because I wanted to have the questions to go back to. So is that something you should inform them to say, is it okay to record this or just don't do it? Um, I, I wouldn't say don't do it because I know people have done it uh, in the past to imp improve their interview school um, skills. But it isn't lawful to record someone without their consent, I believe. But I know some people have actually recorded interviews so that they can remind themselves in their, um, you know, of, of what they said and to improve their skills. One of the issues, though, is that if you are recording, lawfully you're required to let, uh, let the um, people that you're recording know. And... If you haven't turned your phone off and your phone rings, then that would be an issue. But the idea of writing down notes is largely so that you can remind yourselves of what's being said so you can ask one or two questions when you're asked, have you got any questions? Thank you. Yeah, yes, go on. Hi, um, it was just on the point of um, making notes. I've, in you know, different situations I have or I haven't taken notes. Um, but what I do find is when you do take notes, it kind of harnesses a bit of power for yourself and some control in the sense that you're interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you. And yeah. I think um, the panels or interviewers tend to take notice of that. One, that you're taking interest. Uh, in the role in more detail that you want to reflect on the, on the interview and the fact that it's a two-way street as well so I just thought it was something I wanted to um, put out there. Yeah, but thanks so much Anna for that but yes and it's very important because we will get to that point where we actually emphasize that it is a two-way street and you've got the right to actually turn down the role you know following your interview not sure if Amma attended the first workshop that we did on this. Um, no, I missed that one. Oh, oh, oh you missed it. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. we did emphasize that, that it's a two-way street and oh, you've got okay. the right to actually say, no, I, I really don't think this is for me. But we'll get to that point later. But thanks so much for that point. Very valid and quite accurate there. Now, if you're someone, please, and, and, and this is a pet hate of mine, and I, I, I suspect that it may be a pet mate or a pet hate of um, others, then in this workshop if you're someone who clicks the bottom of your pen you know those pens that have a clicker to actually uh, you know i mean extract the tip of the pen if you're someone who fidgets and clicks those pens then please take a pen that doesn't have a clicker at the bottom of it that is so important because companies do not like interviewers don't like you to see you fidgeting and it is a distraction for for a candidate to be clicking away with their pen and you'll find that interviewers don't do that so there's no reason for you and I to do that as well when we attend interviews to fidget with our pen and just to be clicking with it. So if you know that you do that in meetings as well, if you know you do that, if you know you have a tendency to click at the bottom of your pen when you're bored or you're uncertain or you're nervous, then just buy a pen that doesn't have that clicker at the bottom. Body language, the tone of our voice. Now, as Anna just said there, we can end up sounding desperate for a role, especially if we've been struggling with interviews or we've been out of work for a while, we could end up sounding desperate. Again, we could end up sounding aggressive. 
we could end up sounding, we could end up coming across as aggressive or as desperate. And we don't want to come across as either of these. We don't want to come, up, come across as not being confident, as lacking confidence either. So we need to ensure that we're listening to our own voice as we're speaking. And we're listening to the tone of the voices of the interviewers as well. We listen, we listen as we're speaking and we adjust our tone according to how we're being spoken to. But if we're being spoken to aggressively, of course we don't respond with aggression. But we need to be mindful of the tone of our voice as we're speaking. We need to be mindful in our gesticulations as well. I found that I tend to wave my hands around quite a bit. Whereas that may come across, may, and that's not always, but it may come across as aggression. So when I find that I'm doing that, I immediately clasp my hands and put my hands on my lap again. And an interview is an opportunity for us to again, listen and listen and listen. Not to just talk and try to out talk the interviewers in our bid to sell ourselves. Because as Amma said there earlier, it's an, it, they're trying to sell themselves to you just as much as you're trying to sell yourself to the company. So don't approach your interviews as if you are not somebody of worth or value. You're a competent professional being interviewed by equally competent professionals. So view yourself as a competent professional and try to sell yourself like that. Not like a desperate person who the company would be doing a favor in hiring you. When you join a company, they tend to pay you less than, far less than what you're bringing into the company. So you need to sell yourself according to your worth. You know what you carry. You know what you can bring to bear in that company and in that role. So make sure that you're selling yourself, that you're listening out, not only for any positives about the company, but for anything negative as well about the company. Anything negative that may cause you to think, you know what, I don't think this is the right company for me to join. So we listen listen and listen again. In five minutes, we'll, or in 10 minutes rather, we'll take a break, a, a brief um, 15 minute break, just to get a cup of tea and to do other things, and then we'll resume. So when we're asking interview questions, what do we need to ask? We can ask a question about, you know, what, or, or ask a question or two on what we've heard about the company or what we've read about the company during our pre-interview research phase. Ask some questions. I read this. What are your views on this? What are your views? So ask open-ended questions. What are your views? 
So you give them an opportunity to also express what they think about the company, about their CEO. So you're hearing it in person. Ask a question based on what you've been told during the interview. So that's an opportunity for you to also refer back to your notes that you've taken, your bullet points. Because if you've written a life story, if you've written down everything that you've been told word for word, you're bound to have multiple pieces of paper or multiple pages that you now need to scroll through. That's why I suggested bullet points. Ask a question based on what you've been told during the interview or two. Ask a question about, so if you're being interviewed by your direct line manager at, at some point, ask a question about the competencies the hiring manager values the most in their team members. Ask a question about the team culture, the team you're joining. It's so important that you'd be the right fit for the team and that the team would be right for you as well. And if you are keen on the role after you've, um, after you've actually spoken or uh, after you've heard everything you have to hear, then you ask when you might expect to hear from the interviewers. You say, I'm really keen to join you soon based on what I've heard today. So, when might I expect to hear from you? Don't leave the place with them thinking you're not interested unless you really are not interested. Don't hesitate to say you've really impressed me today. And one thing that I've learned from you is that this is really a great place to work in. So when might I expect to hear from you? Don't be scared to ask that. So any questions or comments, please, on the previous slide or this slide? Questions, Very comments? Thanks. Yes, there's a pending question from Sami, and he asked if you have not had any work experience, how do you structure your 30 second speech? Any work experience? Yes, so, so what you tend to do is that you talk about your interests. If you've gained, if, if you've attended any formal or informal workshop or, or sessions around that area that they've invited you in for an interview in, then you need to mention those. So, if you've had no work experience in a role, you've submitted your CV, haven't you, for the job. So you've submitted your CV for the job, they've invited you to the interview because they've seen something in your CV that they like. What you should then be saying is, here are my skills. I'm so interested in this industry that I've attended XYZ workshops. And this is what I've done as, as a volunteer in this industry. Which of course means that we should be attending workshops in our areas of interest. We should be watching TV programs in our areas of interest. So we could mention that as well. Because the fact is that once you've obtained an interview, that means that they've seen something in your CV that they actually like about you, that has caused them to call you in. Did that answer your question, Sammy? Because I think that's a very valid question. How do you, uh, how do you um, create a 30-second elevator pitch for an interview? 
if you haven't had any experience. But the fact is that if they've invited you in for that interview, they already know you don't have any experience, but they've still invited you. Which means it's so important that we make sure that we're doing things in our area of interest, even as a volunteer, in the community, write to companies, say, I'd like to volunteer with you. Read books so you're able, a, able to actually map those and, and, and state those during your elevator pitch. Did that answer your question, Sammy, please? Um, did that answer Sammy's question? Or did that answer the question? And any further questions? Uh, Sammy said yes. Okay. Okay, um, what about any other questions, please? Thank you. Um, can I ask a question, please? Yes, um, of course you can. So this is really um, relating to the um, culture. When you said something about asking um, the team culture. So I had an interview. It wasn't an interview per se, let me put it that way. But it was more like a session to meet with the IRN manager or the manager that I will be working with if I had um, been successful. And um, it was just less than 30 minute session. And she came back after the 30 minute session and and the HR came back and said, oh, um, in terms of skills and everything, you fit in very well. They're very impressed and stuff. Um, but they just feel you're not um, uh, culturally fit. <laughs> and uh, maybe because I, I wasn't expecting that. So the moment I just had, you were not culturally fit. I was just like, okay, thank you. So I didn't bother to ask, like, what do you mean by not culturally fit or anything? So when you mentioned that now, I was just thinking, what does that mean when someone say you're not culturally fit? That's the first time I'll be hearing such. Oh, oh okay, that, that's a very good question. So you, 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 may, or you may find out that, okay, that the team culture is that every Friday they go out for a drink. You may find that everybody just likes to um, put their head down and get on with their work and there's no social interaction you may find that the team is rather hierarchical where you have the team lead not engaging with the with everybody else within the team so how do you then know whether you'd fit into the culture if they say that okay that the team that they're all um, that they're all sociable and they all go out um, to uh, for, for a meal on Fridays or once a month they do all of that. When you now go for a meeting to meet the to meet the team or to meet the team manager or so, you need to now express yourself as sociable. You say, "Oh, I like fun nights out, even though I don't drink, because some of us here may not drink." even though I don't drink, but I'm always good with um, loads of orange juice. So you express yourself as sociable according to the culture that they've stated during your interview. So I, I, I suspect, and, and, and maybe I need to ask this question, was that a follow-up interview after your main interview, Mary? I didn't actually have the main interview. So um, it was with the HR person and she was really impressed. And then the main manager, she just said, oh, you're gonna have a one-to-one -one session. It's not like the main interview. It wasn't even a video interview. It was just like a 30 seconds or no, 30 minutes or less session. And she was actually very late because I thought, oh, maybe this is not happening again. So uh, we just talked about what I've done and everything. So I was open and she said, oh, I'm gonna go on holiday 
um, next week and the following week we would prepare for the main interview where you have interview with other people. So I was looking forward to the main interview and I didn't hear anything back after the week that she's gone for the interview and the HR called me later and said, oh, in terms of skills that uh, she feels you're very good and everything, but culturally, um, um, <laughs> she doesn't think you're fit. But we didn't, we haven't even had the main interview. So that was why I was surprised and I was so like, but one of the questions I think she asked me, the interview was actually with Vodafone, was, um, have you worked with telecommunication? I haven't been. So I said, oh no, I haven't been, but I'm looking forward to you. And I think she said, why Vodafone? So I was saying, oh, why not Vodafone? Vodafone is a big brand name and I talk about things that I've researched about Vodafone and everything. So I wasn't sure why she said you're not culturally fit, but I just wanted to find out um, what she meant. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so, so there may have been other questions that she asked during the, um, during the interview, during that conversation where she felt okay that you may not have been you know the right fit for the team and again it may just have been that the role wasn't right for you or that they found someone else internally because there are many reasons why a company may actually choose to go for someone else Darcy, can i say something yeah, yes go on please Okay. I mean, just from my own little experience, I was just going to say to people that um, I know when I initially started out in the early days looking for work and things, if somebody said I wasn't um, culturally, um, I don't culturally fit in their organisations, I used to be slightly upset because at the end of the day, I would have taken anything. But with my experience in the workplace now, I am being honest with you, if somebody does say to me, um, I don't culturally fit here, I would really thank them because I, I will be honest with you, it is going to be agony. If you end up in the wrong place, you will totally, you know, I mean, you will look back and think, hang on, what was I thinking about? You know, I, I would have been better at home without a job. Do, do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. It's just to So So um, if somebody says that, just thank them and, you know, just pray that at the right place where you're going to fit, where they're going to work on your terms is going to come for you yeah that, that's right absolutely so thank you for that Tess I mean so the job may have been the wrong role for you and yeah and, and, and you really don't want, want to work in a place where the whole team is against you <laughs> it's fine if a manager is against you because I've worked in multiple places where the manager may just not like you because of what you've got to bring to the table, envy, you know, I mean, discrimination, all of that, that's fine. But where the whole team is against you, as Tess said, you really don't want to work in such an environment. You really do not want to work in such an environment. But one thing that I would have done differently, Mary, there is to ask, um, could you give me, you know, I mean, more, then I'm just not the right cultural fit. I mean, could you explain what you mean by that? To I help me in future interviews. So I would have asked that question. Yeah, because it's my first time of hearing search. I haven't ever been told you're not culturally fit. So I was just too upset and I just thank her. Oh, thank you. That's fine. <laughs> That's it. And I just. Yeah, no, 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 I, I and as, as we get to the end of the course, we'll talk about feedback, making sure that we obtain solid feedback from our interviews, regardless of whether they hire us or not. It's always good to obtain feedback. But let's take a 15 minute break and return at 10 minutes to 12, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Hello, so we are welcome back. And one thing that I didn't say about our body language earlier is that we need to remember to smile. Mm -hmm. 
We need to remember to smile at our interviews, smile as soon as you walk into a building. Now I know that life is tough. Life is tough for everybody. Everybody's facing one challenge. But one thing that helped me in my leadership career is that once I realized that, okay, that because I look like my dad, so my dad, um, he passed away this year, thank God, but I look like my dad. And my dad looked masculine, of course, and he had a stern face. And I inherited that trait of a very stern face. And a lot of individuals used to say to me, oh, that when I first saw you, that I used to think that, you, you, that you're so impersonable and that you're one person that I wouldn't like to cross. I wouldn't like to have an argument with. And I realized that if I wanted to lead, that I'd have to make myself more approachable. And I couldn't cut off my face or cut off anything about my face. So the only thing that I knew to do was to learn to smile. To learn to not carry the weight of my burdens into my workplace. Or into the home. So when we're in interviews, Sorry, could we kind of mute our mic there? So when we're attending interviews, we learn to smile. That's part of our body language. As soon as we enter the building, we smile. Not a fake smile, but just learn to smile generally. If you're practicing how to smile through life's tests and challenges, when you get to an interview, you'd smile naturally. Indeed, when you're on a telephone interview, that's one thing that I advise people to actually do, to try and smile because it comes across in your voice when you're smiling. So smile. When you're in a video, interview smile it's not your interviewer's fault that you're facing tests and challenges so smile at them be friendly appear approachable appear approachable part of our body language Small. Questions? So. Hello. Uh, Hello. Dennis Hello. here. Uh, can one make a joke? A it light depends. joke? It depends. It, it, it depends. It absolutely depends. But you've asked a very valid question there. I tend to joke a lot, but it depends. If you're in a panel, if, if you're facing a panel where everyone is dead serious, then you don't want to be making any jokes or, um, or saying, hey, what, 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 why are you all so serious? Let them make the first joke. Let them make the first joke if you're facing the panel. But at reception, yeah, you've got more room. With the security guard, you've got more room. However, when you're facing a panel or you're facing your interviewer, view their style, first of all. If they're deadpan serious, then you really don't want to be cracking a joke. But if they come across as friendly and they say something like, then of course, you need to respond in the same manner in which you're being addressed. So we'll respond according to how we're being addressed.
but I love laughter. So that's always something that I'm mindful of. Yes, and I will crack a joke if I think that the panel might be receptive to that joke. But if I think that I'm going to say something and they're just going to look at me like, what's wrong with her? And then move on to the next question, then I won't crack that joke. Now, when we talk about asking interview questions and this, um, you know, I mean, that question has just led me to state this again. Now, in all of my interviews that I've attended previously, I've always asked a question that they've asked me. So say for example, they ask, what are my um, greatest weaknesses? Then when I go to ask that question of the hiring manager, for example, they tend to laugh and they say, no one's ever asked me that before. Or in another interview, I, I was asked some questions and I said, I don't know the response to that, but I'm sure that if, if I were being, if this question, if I came across this question when doing the talk, I'd Google the answer, or I'd find out from peers or friends or even from within the team. So I responded in that manner and they nodded their heads. But when we now came to the point where I was now asking them questions, I asked them the same question that they asked me. I think they asked me two questions where, where I didn't know the answers. And I said, I'd find out, you know, I'd know where to find out. But when I now came to ask them questions, I threw those same questions back at them. And they all laughed and said, no one's had the nerve to do that to them before. And I did get the job because they found it quite funny. So that's a way of joking, actually. That is a way of joking. So you introduce jokes according to the, you know, I mean, according to the body language and the way you perceive your interviewers to be. You give them back or throw back the questions that they've asked of you to them as well. So when, they, when they're now asking you, why should we hire you? Can anyone tell me what they'd say? Um, can I go for it? Yes, definitely. Uh, I think it's more like what you know about the company and what value you're going to add to them when you're coming on board, the value you're going to be adding to the company and to the team. Yeah, absolutely. Your values that you'd be bringing to the team and your unique competencies. You need to be able to offer something more unique than to say, well, I've been a business analyst for 15 years. Because they may have interviewed someone who's been a business analyst for 20 years. So what are the unique competencies and abilities and skills that you can bring to the job? I'll tell you to the requirements of that job. If, for instance, they're looking for a BA in security space, I would touch about my current or previous experience and the practicality or, or the things that I've you know, encountered on that role the things that they would understand, especially the hiring manager would understand, is very, very unique to that role. So I'll just be pointing that out. Is it, you know, creating the receipt for the people that will be sanctioning websites or not, you know, the difficulties of engaging with them and getting them to agree. You just hone in onto that particular thing that you know that the hiring manager can relate with. Yeah, exactly. So you need to make it specific to that role Excuse me, can I say something? Yeah, yeah, go on. Ah, uh, yes, I, I would say maybe it's the other way of asking you, convince me that you are the right person for the job. Yeah, 
so what would you say if they say why you yeah yes yeah. so, so so yes it's another way of asking you to convince them but what all would you say things, uh, all those things that relates to the job how you think you're competent enough to fulfill the role and then how you think you are fit for the role so yes. in other words, everything that you've done that relates to the role exactly everything you've done and everything you can do that you think this will bring my unique flavor to the role for example if it's a stakeholder management role you can say well yes that i've got experience managing um, difficult stakeholders and uh, I, I often give an example of when I was hired in a role in 2004. So I went into that role in 2004 and we had about 150 sites across England and Wales then. And, and um, we wanted to actually consolidate those 150 sites. And what did we end up with? We had each of the managers across those sites being very resistant to forming part of, uh, to becoming a joint organization. Each of those entities were single entities previously for 40 years, and suddenly we're now coming to say to them, okay, you're going to come onto one active directory network, you're going to be part of this single corporation. So what do I say to organizations? I say, well, in terms of managing stakeholders, that I drew on my journalism and communication skills. Because that is my original background. I drew on my journalism and, uh, and communication skills. And I went to strategic sites around the country to talk to some of the more vocal critics of the plan that I had. I talked to them and then I asked them if they were interested in becoming champions for IT and InfoSec. And so I then go on to say that, so they became champions and advocates for IT and information security. And by the time I left that organization, nine years later, they were on a committee champion, championing IT and InfoSec, even when I was not present. They'd set up regional committees and they now, the critics had now turned into champions. So I'll talk about things that I specifically done in that particular area. So that's stakeholder management. If you're asked why you for a business analyst role, you need to be able to articulate something that you've done in the past that would set you apart from every other business analyst. And if you haven't had a job before, again, what are you doing in the community? If you've just graduated from university, did you do anything in uni around your area of interest? Did you lead, or did you lead the student union? Did you set up an info set committee in, um, in the, um, on the campus? Did you lead any debates? So again, you articulate what makes you stand out from the other candidates that they're potentially interviewing. And when they ask the question, tell us a time when you did this, please remember to check your watch and see how long You've got left for the interviews. Don't spend 10, for the interview rather, don't spend 10 minutes articulating what you did, answering one question, knowing that the interview is going to finish in about 10 minutes time. And that means that you won't have the opportunity to ask your questions. They won't have the opportunity to ask you all the questions that they had and they just end up bundling you out of the door. So when they say, tell us a time when, be mindful of the time. Be mindful of the time. Don't give a life story 
give a brief start summary and then you could ask or would you like me to continue answering interview questions again a common question is what do team members say about you or what would your managers say about you so you need to draw up the positives that paints you in the light of the company culture so you've read about the company culture you've identified the team loves fun so you can say yep yeah, team members say that i'm really hard working but i'm also balanced because in my lunch time i relax i chill I ask team members if they've got anything that they'd like to talk about. I also, you know, have a laugh. I enjoy having a laugh. So you need to relate it to the team culture that you've read about on Glassdoor, for example. Relate to what your team members say about you to what you've read about the company on Glassdoor. Where do you see yourself in five years time? That's a question that is asked commonly. And my response, which may be different to yours, is whilst I would like to be in XYZ role, working for a company that values me and where I've been able to contribute towards the company's growth, I fully understand that the world is changing so rapidly now that I'm flexible enough to adapt to a different role if necessary. So you can say, oh, I'd like to be a business analyst in five years time or senior business analyst. But what happens if there's more opportunities in project management at the time? It in five years time. So you need to be able to articulate your vision and your direction of travel whilst also maintaining that you are flexible enough to adapt in the future, to work in the future. Many of us started off our careers or, start, or went to uni to study one thing and we're no longer working in the area that we studied in. So again, we need to express our flexibility and our recognition that the world of work keeps evolving, especially with technology. The world of work is evolving. So we express our vision we express our flexibility as well. And we express our understanding that the world of work is evolving on a day-to-day -day basis. Tell me about a time you achieved against the odds. Again, you need to make sure that you keep it short and simple and be mindful of the time. Tell me about a time you missed a target Please make sure that when we say we missed a target, we express the work that we did towards meeting the target. We express what caused us to miss the target without blaming somebody else. That's so important. We don't blame our line manager for not signing off on work that we did. So we express the time we missed the target we, ex we express what we did, and then we express what we did to remediate things and to bring things back on track. So don't just say, "Oh, I, I, I forgot to submit a, um, I forgot to submit a report, or, or, or I had a tight deadline and I missed that deadline." You can talk about the hard work that, that you stayed up all night for three nights in a row to try and meet the deadline. But once you recognize that you were going to miss it, you contacted XYZ, you tried to get help from within the team, you told your line manager, 
But because there were no resources and you recognize that everyone did everything they could to help you to meet that target, you miss the target, but you manage to do X, Y, Z to reduce the impact of that miss. So I managed to complete it a day late because I didn't go for lunch, I didn't do this, I didn't do that. So don't just say, this happened and I missed the target. Articulate the hard work you did and articulate what you did afterwards to help to reduce the impact to the business when you miss that target. What are your strengths and weaknesses? Don't say I have no weaknesses. Please don't say you have no weaknesses because absolutely every human being under the sun has at least one weakness. But when you're stating you have a weakness, always say what you're doing about it and how far you've progressed. One of my weaknesses, and I haven't progressed that far, is that if I, see, if I identify a project or identify a problem in particular, I'll stay and I'll work and work and work. I may stay on that issue for 20 hours without leaving my desk, especially when I'm working from home, until I've resolved the problem. But that is not a strength. It is actually a weakness. And I've identified that it's a weakness because every human being needs to take a break. And besides that, what I'm doing about that weakness, having identified that every human being needs to take a break, I've also identified that sometimes when I take a break, go home or take a nap, I then come, I then get to a point where I realize that actually that the solution to the problem that I've spent so many hours working on just comes, just comes to my mind because I've taken a break away from the problem, away from the situation. So based on that, we need to make sure that when we're articulating our weaknesses, we're always talking about what we're doing about those weaknesses and how we're progressing. So now that I've started taking a break away from my computer, I've started to understand that when I take a break, the solution might come more readily. So we always articulate what we're doing about our weaknesses. And when we're talking about our strengths, please don't say my strength is in IT. If you're going for an IT role, that isn't a strength. That is a competency. That is knowledge. You've got knowledge about IT. You're knowledgeable about IT. What are your strengths? They're looking for your character traits. They're trying to tease out whether You've got strengths in your character that could make you the right fit for the team. So they're looking for personal strengths and personal weaknesses. What do we do when we're leaving or after we've left? So we, the first thing we do, if we want the job, is to send an email to say thank you. If we've been sent by a recruiter, we say to the, we, we ring the recruiter as soon as we walk out of the door to say thank you. I'd really like to work for that company. I'd really like to work for that company. I enjoyed the interview because of X, Y, Z. So don't just say, I'd really like to work for the company, but you then again, take out your notepad and say, because X, Y, Z said this and that. 
in your thank you email, you reiterate your desire to work with the company, or if you've reached the decision to no longer pursue the role, then you also say that in your email. Although if you reach that decision during your interview, during whilst you're still in front of the panel, you may actually realize from one of their answers that, oh, that, um, that, 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 no, that, that this isn't the right fit for you. And there's absolutely nothing wrong in politely saying, um, excuse me, please, that I've listened to all you have to say, and I really appreciate this company, and I really appreciate all of your time, but, but I don't think this, is, this role is the right fit for me. That way, you're not wasting their time, they're not wasting your time, and everybody goes along with their day. As long as you're being civil about it, that doesn't shut the door to future opportunities within that company because you've already said that I really would enjoy working with this company, but I don't think this role is the right fit for me. So say for example, your teetotal and the company says that every single evening you must come to the pub because that is the team culture. You know that that's not going to be the right company for you, and uh, sorry, the right team for you rather. And as I said earlier, you really do not want to work in a company where you don't fit in with the team culture. You don't want to do that. It is a drain and a strain. It is really stressful to work within a team where you're not valued and where you don't fit in. So you reiterate your desire to work with the company or, or your decision to no longer pursue that particular opportunity. And you can request, if the company says that you're, well, well, you can request in your email actually saying that if I'm successful in this interview, that I'd really appreciate if the team and the company could retain my CV on file in case another role comes up or in case the successful candidate doesn't show up and leave your phone number there. If this happens, if the successful candidate doesn't um, show up, kindly contact me directly on XYZ. They'll laugh at that, at your cheek, but guess what? If the successful candidate doesn't turn up, they will ring you because you've expressed your willingness to be reconsidered. Now, during your, during your interview, you may want to ask if you could send a LinkedIn connection to your line manager, a LinkedIn request. Ask the question. Ask if you could request a LinkedIn connection with your potential line manager. And if they say yes, then you know that you're able to do so. If they say no, then, um, then don't. But you could follow them all the same because on LinkedIn, you could follow someone rather than request the connection. So ask the question. And you keep searching until you find the job that you desire not just any job but a job that you actually desire a job that you know that you'd be happy doing you keep searching don't let anything hold you back don't let feedback from a previous interview distress you or something else that has happened to you to cause you to stop searching 
between 2013 and 2019, when I got my current job, I submitted over 10,000 applications. And I didn't let the fact that my name was out there as having been dismissed deter me from doing so. So you keep searching until you find the job that you desire. And just remember this, that people are still getting jobs during this pandemic. So you will as well. People are definitely still getting jobs. We had a delegate who attended the last ACO interview workshop and within a fortnight, she'd gotten a role. So based on that, there's nothing to stop you from getting a job, whether it's due to your age. Again, I've had two friends, two classmates, not just friends, so two classmates in their 50s obtaining roles, first timers in the industry, by the way, first timers in the industry. One obtained a testing role with Capita and one attended, one attended three interviews for a single role as an IT business analyst stroke projects analyst with a charity. And this is in September. So based on that, there are roles out there and people are still getting jobs and there's nothing to stop you from getting the job that you desire except you. Nothing can stop you except you. You've got to be determined, you've got to be focused, you've got to remain encouraged and let each rejection spur you on to your role, to your new role. Because every day that you wake up, each interview you attend, you're getting closer to your desired role. You're not moving further away each day you wake up. You're moving a day closer. So don't let anything deter you. Just prepare for your interviews, do your research, remain encouraged, keep smiling, keep learning as well. There's a lot of free learning resources on LinkedIn, on YouTube. There's this BA business analysis um, 60 slides um, learning thing on YouTube as well. I've forgotten what it's called, but there's plenty of free resources to learn to hone up your skills. So let's keep learning, let's keep believing that you know what, that I will get my desired job, whether it's as a first timer or as an aged person who's returning into a role, as someone who's been out of work for two years, for three years, it doesn't matter. There is a job out there for you. But just go out there, get the interview, Get in the door, ace your interview, and let's just see what will happen. How did you learn? Sorry, I have kids playing here with my daughter. Okay. Um, having said that, the nature of what I do in Scotland, I engage with the public sector, some other groups, and um, from the seminar that I had a couple of days ago and the parliament the, the parliament session that they do every day and I attend there was one specifically last week that was targeting black people because they realized that there is a lot of disadvantage you know in the sector and one thing they have done is the the, the government the Scottish government has I don't know if the same in England but they've released some funding for employers in the private and uh, public sector. And the only way they can qualify for that funding, especially in COVID-19 era, is that at least they must have 
black people employed in that role. So if we don't, if you're looking for a job, this is the time. Start looking at private and government sectors for some roles you know you can do because they have the money, the government has given them the money, and they need to fill those spaces with black people. Black and minority especially, black people especially because of what has happened over the last couple of months, you know, Black Lives Matter, George Floyd, and black people are now finding their voices. This is the time for you to now look at that opportunity. Stop looking at England alone. Now that we can all work from home, apply. Yes. Just look for the job, apply. And if you need help, come back and ask for a new workshop. Oh, I have a, jo a job interview. Can I have a one-to-one? -one? Or can we have a group session? Please, exactly. this is the time. Exactly, and, and I really appreciate you mentioning that to me, that um, with the Black Lives Matter um, you know, protests going on, this is an ample opportunity for um, you know for black professionals, black people to actually just get out there and um, you know, I mean and show what you've got. Um, th there was this joke going around in the immediate aftermath of um, of George Floyd's uh, murder, where people were saying that they would put all their Nigerian names or African names on their CV, spell out the ten names that they've been given, or put their country's flag on their CV to prove that they're ethnic minorities. But Timmy is absolutely right. There are many organizations out there now just wanting to be politically correct and that are now hiring more black people. So all we need to do is to prepare by studying and then getting all the, that knowledge on our CV, free courses, get the knowledge on your CV. Once you understand what you're studying, put it on your CV and then apply for roles. And the fact is that very often we think, oh, I don't want to apply for that 40K job, that 40K um, project manager job or that 40K business, business analyst job, not recognizing that in many firms, a lot of people have left or, or will turn their nose up at that 40K business analyst job. They'll say, I don't want to do that. I was earning 80K before, so why should I go and earn 40K? So that means that that job is there for your take. Hello. Job is Sorry, go on. Can I ask a question? Yes, go on, Jackie. Hi, hi. I was on your first course. I was the lady who said um, I was going to retire. Anyway. <laughs> Um, and I did the elevator pitch last time. Mm -hmm. um, and what's happened since then, I've actually got an interview for um, a really uh, a good job. But what happened was I um, applied for the job. They gave me the interview. Then they said there was a clash. They couldn't do it. And then um, they gave me a different date, which I couldn't do. Anyway, they've come back to me now and they're going back to the original date. But I'm just a bit worried that that's going to sort of like go against me a bit because they've had to like unravel their plans to accommodate me. I'm just wondering <laughs> how, how do I how do I kind of when I'm going in, you know, sort of kind of apologize, you know, for not being yeah, able to. I, I, absolutely. But but you shouldn't be worried, Jackie, because for me, I mean, that shows that they're clearly interested in you for them to have for them to have unraveled their plans in quote yeah for you that clearly shows that they can see the value that you've got and so as you've just rightly answered your own question there the first thing you do when you attend the interview is to simply say i really really appreciate the fact that you've had to change your plans to accommodate me but i'm grateful for for that and that's really why i'm keen to join this mm -hmm. company Oh, thank you. That's 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 perfect because I didn't know how to start that off. And the other yeah, thing no. is, and the other thing is a bit of a techie um, question. Um, I normally do um, work via Zoom and Microsoft Teams, but they don't use that. They're now saying they want to use um, Google Hangouts, I, and I, I don't. I've never used that before, and I don't know how easy it that. I ask them for like a practice run. Um, no, 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 so that no. I can make my technology 
make sure that my technology is working okay. Do, do you know what I would do? I, I, I would go on to YouTube and, um, you know, and look for how to use Google Hangouts. If right. they're using that for the interview, there's absolutely nothing wrong in saying, could you go for a practice run? But I'd first go through YouTube. And if there's right. anyone on here, and Timmy, have you used Google Hangouts before? I have, and you can actually get a few friends together and say, please, let's exactly. practice. Okay. okay. So, uh, it's, free, it's free technology. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I will try that. But can I just say thank you very much for making me practice my elevator um, <laughs> speech because I, I have to do a five-minute speech um, at the start of the interview. So I'm okay. quite confident now in, in as how I'm going to do that. So thank you very much. You're welcome, but but you always had it and I'm, I'm pleased that you haven't retired yet. No, I haven't, no. <laughs> yeah, I, I know that was meant to be five years fine, but, but, but that's fantastic. And good luck with your oh. interview. I mean, they clearly can see your value, which is why they've agreed to change, right. change the timings for you once more. So use that to your advantage. Just express okay. immense gratitude. Make sure you emphasize that, yes, that you appreciate what they've done. And that's why you're keen to yeah. join the firm. If you've read anything on Glassdoor that's positive, then you can say, yes, I mean, that uh, again, I read something X, Y, Z on Glassdoor. And you, you have truly shown me that, yes, that I've reached the right decision in applying for this job. Because, you know, you, you've just been, you know, Mm. so kind as to rearrange everything yeah, yeah to rearrange everything so you express that gratitude so that they know yeah that okay this person's yeah okay thank you thank you very much you're welcome any other questions comments I just wanted to say something regarding the um, um, not meeting the deadline um, um, for the different points that you've given. I think one other thing that I usually do then when I don't meet deadline is I let the person that I'm expected to submit the deadline to know that I'm actually running late. So maybe if I notice that an hour or half, half a day, I'm not going to be able to do it. I just send them an email that I'm running later. I might actually still be able to turn it in, but maybe if not, I would probably be late for the next half, half a day or the next day so maybe yes, that, know as well yeah, yes that's quite right it's good it's brilliant to notify um, them in advance if you might be running late and I often do that even if I'm going to visit a friend and I, and I hit traffic or so or you know going for an interview or going for whatever I will simply ring and say I'll park and I'll ring and let them know that okay I'm running late that I may be late and then I always end up turning up five minutes in advance or just on time anyway, but I'll ring to let them know. So it's very important that you don't just send an email, actually, that you try and speak to the person and you try and find, you know, just in case that they can say, well, OK, I can um, delegate some more resources to help you to turn it in on time. So rather than say that you send an email, you can say, okay, that I always try and speak to the person just to see if more resources can, can be allocated or to see if I can be taken off one project or be taken off something else or be excused from a meeting so that I can spend more time to turn this around. So, but very valid point there. We need to make sure that we let the assignee the person that has assigned the, uh, the the task to us we need to let them know if we think there's a possibility that we won't meet the deadline not if we know we won't meet the deadline if we think there's a possibility that we won't meet the deadline it's so important we let them know in advance and we also ask if there's anything that they can think of that can help us to meet the deadline, including more resources or to, to attend a meeting or delegate a meeting or delegate some tasks to other people so that we can solely focus on that assigned task. So thank you for that point. 
Any other questions? Any other comments? Any other contributions? Yeah. Um, thank you, Ibukun. Thank you so much. Uh, you mentioned something um, about not wasting um, our own time or the interviewer's time um, by kind of uh, canceling the interview uh, while the interview is going on. It's happened to me before. Um, I went for this job. I haven't got the good experience in it um, as a as an SAP analyst, that was a long time ago. And um, when they started asking questions, you know, um, I was like, wow, what have I got myself into? You know, but I had to tell them, I said, you know what? Um, I think we need to cancel this um, interview. I said, firstly, I'm not sure I am in my right state of mind. And secondly, I'm not too sure if I would like to work in this environment. And um, they said, and I just said that because I knew most of the questions that they were asking me, you know, I've not been able to, to answer, not all the questions, just a few of them. Um, and they appreciated it and they were like, okay, yeah, thank you, we have to close it and da, 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 you know, and um, that was it. So I, they, they I did not give them the chance to know more about my capacity or my, but I, I, I canceled the interview by myself. So um, I just want you to kind of um, address that area. And secondly, I've been to a job before that. Before I got to the interview, uh, I was actually panting because I wasn't too sure, you know, but I got the job. Um, I got there and um, the, the I, they actually, I took over the interview. They asked me to talk and I talk and eventually they gave me the job. And um, that's boys that I just want to say, if you can address the area of confidence uh, in an interview, I think that would be very great. Um, what happened to me um, that I mentioned earlier, happened to um, another friend, um, a younger uh, friend actually, and um, Honestly, after the interview, during the interview, he said uh, it was like the, the grant should just open his mouth and it should just jump into you and, you know, just die because the, the, the situation it was was so terrible that even the interviewer, uh, uh, they were asking him, uh, who are you? Are you really this person? Where did you get this CV from? And all the rest of it, you know, and uh, it was so very, very terrible. Um, so I think I've mentioned uh, two things there, um, but everything just boils down to, uh, to confidence, basically. Not just confidence, yeah, yeah, but thank you for those two illustrations. It's not just confidence, it's also about fit. So, so sometimes you may not have all the skills that are required, and yet they like you. If, if, if the interviewers like you, but you don't have all the skills, you're, you're better off than you've got all the skills, but the interviewers don't warm to you. They don't like you. You understand? So it's vital that we yeah. make sure that we come across as personable. Huh that we come across as personable, you understand, that we come across as people that the interviewers would like to work with. Yeah. That is so important. But if you don't have any of the skills that are required, don't go and copy someone else's CV and hope to bluff your way through it, through the interview. Please let's not just say, okay, here, you know, I mean, because I share my CV with anybody and everybody, but I always say only include things that you can do from my CV on your CV, not things that you've simply read about, but you're not sure if you can do or not. Because let's say you attend an interview and you actually are asked to sit a test, a theoretical test for us or a practical test. What are you going to do then? So 
let's remember to be personable. That should be our number one, which is why I said, and, and I've repeatedly said, that we need to make sure that we, you know, are amenable and personable to everyone from the security guard through to our interviewers from the minute we approach the building. So it's so important, let's be personable. Let's be personable. Let's be personable. Let's be personable. And Tayo, I note that you say that we go online, search for possible interview questions and answers and structure our responses by individual job role. But that what I said at the beginning, I wasn't sure if you were here is that I try to provide my own unique questions and answers because if I go online and I search for individual, you know, I mean, for all these possible interview questions and answers, then what I've read might stick in my brain as it might stick in the brain of everyone else on the on the interviews or sorry online that's googled that same page so if we all then attend the same interview and give the same questions and answers how do they then select the right person which is why i've spoken about conducting your research and then drawing out your unique questions from your research because your research and the questions that you will derive from your research will be different to absolutely everyone else that will go for an interview at that company. So it's great to search for possible interview questions and answers, but it's better to just draw up your own unique questions and answers. Don't be put off if you can't do absolutely everything in the role profile, because if they've invited you for an interview, then that means that they've seen something that they like about your CV. But when you get there, be confident, but also be willing to say, I'm not sure about that. But if this were on the job, then I would know where to find the answer to that question. So if they ask you, for example, how, do you, um, uh, how would you deal with um, a difficult stakeholder? You could say, well, I mean, that, uh, that I'm quite personable and I've managed this situation and that situation before. But if you haven't handled that situation before, then you could say, in addition, that here's how I would hypothetically handle this. But if I didn't know how to handle that situation, then I could talk to peers. I could talk to peers. I've got a mentor. I would, I would find a mentor within the company. I could talk to my line manager. Because no man is an island. So. Further questions, so uh, further comments, um, questions, comments, disagreements with anything that I've said? I have a question. Yes, go on. And it's not to use to everyone um, attending. We, if I just first, for, first, I want you to type in the chat, uh, in the chat, group chat, if you have found this session you know important and you found it helpful just say yes or no um could everyone also go and put it on the linkedin uh, sorry ladder back down page as well fantastic look at the yes is coming through so that yes with a neat a nice line just to say thank you or whatnot Go to ladder back down and do exactly that. We really need this, please. Thank you. And yes, so on, if, if if you want to take it a, a step further, I know people from our community are very very camera shy. I want to create a video for a one minute video, for or two minute video to advertise future 
ladder back down SEO interview skills mm -hmm. sessions. But it would be nice to have one, two, three, or four people say a nice thing about the, about the session on video. Just send it to the, my WhatsApp so that I can use it in the, in the promo because, you know, nothing, nothing sells more like, you know, um, self-referral, one-to-one, you know, people talking about how good the session is. I know you've enjoyed it. I thank you all for all the nice comments. <laughs> thank you. But it yeah. really, really will go a long way. If you can record, even if it's a five seconds video, 10 seconds video, send it to my WhatsApp or the WhatsApp group. I want to create that video for Adva because lots, lots of people could not log in today because we reached a hundred uh, seat. Um, the event was supposed to be for a hundred people and the maximum, we maxed it out. And I started getting texts and messages that, oh, they missed out. When is the next one? We also have a group that is waiting now. We're not asking you to pay. We're just asking you to do your bit to support us so that we can support others as well. Thank you. So if you can, please let me know. I'll send my number in the group chat now so that you can have it. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Anna. And as you can see, so again, just emphasizing the fact that Timmy is not personal assistant or a secretary. Timmy is a, um, a professional consultant, just multi-skilled, multi-talented. She's a business analyst. She's also a program manager. She's a project manager. She's also a PR manager. She's, um, she's um, um, more capable than me of um, marketing and um, selling and just um, you know, shining a highlight on everything that you may want to do or to become. So um, please let's also celebrate her in, um, you know, bringing this workshop to you today because um, without her, I couldn't have done it. I would have probably had five delegates in a room, you know, and we would have just gotten on with our thing. But there are more than five delegates, more than five black, and ethnic minorities out there that need to um, obtain support to progress in their careers. And that's what we're all about, to just send that ladder back down to people from our backgrounds in our community so that, um, you know, we, we, we can all share in, um, you know, in the good things that life has to offer. Please connect with me on LinkedIn. Please follow the page, Ladder Back Down, and please comment about the course, any workshops that you attend or that you may attend in future. Please also comment on um, LinkedIn about these. Mm -hmm. And I will be going straight away to open up the Forex workshop in case anyone's interested in that. I know it's not for everybody, but I'll open that up and you just need to watch the page or view the page on um, Ladder Back Down and register there when you're ready to do so. Uh, please don't forget to tell them about the leadership training as well, although we don't have it on the website. Oh, oh yes, so, so we haven't set a date for that, which is why. So we're looking to, um, as we said at the beginning of the course, actually just do something for any of us who may want to sit on boards or, to, or we may be school governance or we may be charity trustees, including in places of religion. It's so important that we actually understand the legal responsibilities that we have as board directors, recognizing that it's not, well, you, you know, I mean, that, that, um, that being a board director is not just a title. It's actually a legal responsibility. Being a charitable trustee is not a title. It's a legal responsibility. And some people don't actually appreciate that or realize that even. And they may have been working with um, charitable organizations as trustees or with um, private organizations as board directors for many years, not realizing the legal implications. So we'll do, um, so, so we'll make sure that um, we bring that, that training and those workshops to you in the future. So thank you to everyone. It's um, a few minutes past one and I don't want to take up any more of your day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I just uh, want to okay. thank you so much. 
uh, for this session. It has been very, very instructive. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, all the interview tips, I really, uh, really appreciate uh, uh, Timmy and then uh, yourself for putting this together. My question is, uh, is there any place we can, is it, if it's recorded, can we have access to it? Yeah, yeah, yes, you're, you're, you're correct there. And um, thank you for asking that question. So I'll actually send out a link um, at some stage um, over the weekend. I was going to say today, but if I can't do it today, then tomorrow I'll send out a link. But I don't know how um, we can get that link to everyone because not everyone registered on the website. But I'll okay. definitely send the link out to you and, I'll, and Timmy will then send it out to everyone who she sent it out to. And then everyone she sent it out to will probably send it out to anyone that they sent the link out to themselves. Okay. Uh, well, another way to do that is if you want to be part of the Ladder Background uh, WhatsApp group, if you just I've put my number a few times on the group chat, just send me a text and I'll add you to the group. So that way, whatever training we have now and in the future, you can have uh, updated information. And if you have questions about you know, sessions that you have attended, you can ask on the group, which we have been doing for the past few weeks. Can you put that number up again, please, if you don't mind, Timmy? I just miss it, please. Okay. Sorry. And uh, may I just add that my amazing husband, Emmanuel, has just announced that we're setting up a YouTube channel, and that's his Yay. expertise. Yay. So, <laughs> so, so he will set up that YouTube channel, and, and we'll put the um, we'll put the video up on there, and any future videos as well. Exactly. And yes, we do actually do stuff on um, public speaking, although um, that's the first time that I've been asked, um, Rosie. So it'll be interesting to see how many others are actually interested in public speaking because um, oh. that is a passion of mine. And yeah. there is a post on, on the Ladder Back Downs website about public speaking because I've got a video somewhere in cyberspace um, <laughs> on public speaking, which I may actually move to the Ladder Back Downs YouTube channel as well. Oh my so God, God bless you all. Yeah. Thank you. That's fantastic. I think everyone needs that public speaking, whether you are skilled in that area or not. Sometimes you just get to some, you know, some environment and you think, oh my gosh, I'm taking a dent in my confidence. Please register for that public speaking phobia. You are never going to get bored. Just attend. Yeah, I'd love <laughs> okay. to Okay. I, I, I didn't even know that that was a course that was um, really desired. But yeah, I'll, I'll do something on public speaking because, um, yeah, it is a passion of mine and I enjoy speaking. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ide. Thank you so much. Yeah, and everyone. thank you to everyone you. that are... Um... Oh, you guys are amazing. Thank, thank you, you so thank much. You. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all. So that Thank is, you very uh, much. Yeah, yes, also Emmanuel has put there, that is my husband, he's put there, yes, I mean, that he'd be interested in, um, in public speaking because he's been holding some sessions where he's been calling, referring to COVID-19 as COVID-D. And if he's pronouncing David Doe or something, and, and I keep pressing. <laughs> COVID-19. <laughs> COVID <laughs> you know? Yeah. We'll make sure that we arrange for the, for the sessions. So, so, so please follow the, um, you know, at the ladder back down on LinkedIn or the page itself, the website itself, if you don't have LinkedIn, and we'll make sure that we update, keep updating those venues with all the courses that we've got coming yeah. up. Thank you all, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a fantastic week. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.